so uh, my priority to begin with at the start of my earning journey was to have surplus and not get into a period of shortage so i began my work life with an education loan on me so which is which is something that i took to do my mba so my first priority was to pay off the loan and you always invest in mutual funds entirely i i sincerely believed in the mutual fund way of working huge believer in insurance i'm a huge believer in so you know not for uh, for investment purposes and i for climb sure. mountains i i take an insurance for death at 7000 meters discipline if it's important in personal finance which i think it is staying consistent at running has helped me uh, imbibe that well uh, i have been fortunate enough to uh, to have uh, you know family who are engaged in farming and uh, it was pandemic time and and the farm was a great place to to work out of i'd like to have a home also built uh, on the farm Hello and welcome. This is Neil Borate. I am deputy editor at Mint, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. Vandana Trivedi is head of passives and institutional sales at Access Mutual Fund. She's had a two-decade-long career in asset management, but apart from that, she's also a long-distance runner, and she's also a farmer. And all of that feeds into her personal finance decisions, how she manages her money. Welcome, uh, Vandana. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, Neil. Vandana, can you take us through your childhood and uh, your career, and how it has shaped your outlook towards finance? I uh, belong to a family of uh, salaried father, a single-income household. Uh, I'm the eldest of uh, three children, all of us girls, and uh, my dad used to work for a public sector bank. and therefore we've been uh, i've spent my childhood schooling in different cities across the country and uh, i after mba i joined the asset management industry so i've uh, pretty much been a career asset management person now since since the first time i started working in terms of how my childhood has um, and and my early career may have uh, shaped my financial decision making i think um, i came from a, from a context of shortage more than surplus because surplus leads to financial investments and financial or the need to to decide on financial matters so uh, my priority to begin with at the start of my earning journey was to have surplus and not get into a period of shortage so i began my work life with an education loan on me so which is which is something that i took to do my mba so my first priority was to pay off the loan and only then start thinking about investments so i can say that the beginning of my financial journey was to deleverage and achieve position of sufficiency Uh, and it's only in the later part of my life that i encountered surplus and therefore uh, getting necessitated to think about uh, financial decision making was it scary how large was the loan compared to your first salary uh the loan was um, exactly uh, uh, 10 times my first salary <laughs> so and and by the time i i drew my first salary was also married so married very early therefore there was the household responsibilities as well and the salary was used to pay off uh, the loan at least the initial part of uh, my earning was kind of set aside to pay back the loan um no neil it wasn't scary the loan amount itself wasn't scary but it was a kind of a conviction that i do not want to have a loan on my head so the priority clearly was to prioritize paying back the loan over every other uh, decision and how many years did it take to pay back the loan the education loan i think i paid back within a year of wow. uh, starting work because double income that was paid off i i pretty much a little over a year maybe but i pretty much set aside all my income to to paying off the loan and therefore we lived single income for the period that i paid off my loan But if it was 10 times your salary that means you must have I pretty much paid off the entire thing as in how the monthly salaries came in right, right. and um, and therefore you know uh, kind of did it away with the loan salary, yeah. yeah 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 sorry yeah 10 times <laughs> monthly salary i'm sorry yeah yeah right. so yeah. so that's how i went about uh, initially beginning to pay off my education loan 
and then uh, you know there was another personal financial emergency which was not covered by insurance etc which was a big amount for which later i took a personal loan it was in reality a question of life and death of someone in the family for which there was no insurance cover so I took a personal loan for that now that was a big amount that took some time to pay back so um, the initial uh, say for 5 years of my work life was marked by paying off loans so so that's how i not a great start i would say but things have changed along the way so you moved from there to your first goal in life which was buying a home yes that's right can you tell us about that while i've been in this industry for the last 20 years and and uh, you know there is financial wisdom uh, which we believe in which we talk about in in my head uh, having a home that i can call my own became very important as a priority item it's not that i didn't understand the math of uh, you know rental yield versus uh, you know owning a house and all of that but it was just that um, i wanted a house of my own and uh, we ended up buying a home in this city bombay therefore it came with a price tag for where we were in our respective careers at that point in time our affordability etc and also that kids had also by then come along it was a, a kind of a tight spectrum in terms of finances but having the home was important and again you know considering my mindset about not being levered crept in once more all over again and really spent a uh, you know spent the better part of the next um, you know 4 to 6 years you may say paying off the home and other additional expenses that we incurred in interiors and all of that so that marked the you know at least the first 10 years of my work life so house was created within the first 10 years of the work life and the loan was paid off uh, within that period so you went from paying off the education loan to paying off the home loan to paying off the personal loan, loan. <laughs> to then paying off the home loan so you know that that was my journey for the better part of my initial years of the first uh, of the work 10. life yeah you could say almost 50% of my work life was spent in that there were obviously you know as i graduated over the course of those first 10 years there was surplus of course even after paying off the emi etc for the housing loan thanks to how you know the industry treated us and you know obviously how we were able to grow professionally but meaningful investable surpluses to sit down and plan for for future etc did not happen for the first 10 years of my work life do you think that um, you know bombay home homes are have always been crazy priced but yes were they in general slightly more affordable than uh, than they are now than what your children would have to pay if they were for to buy a home here so uh, firstly my my children are uh, yet to you know reach that uh, that kind of a life stage where they can even think about they still studying so that's the immense overhang of emotion that comes into play when you make some of these investment decisions right when i bought uh, into uh, this place which i own now the property markets were on a high after that for the last 10 years if you if i mean you you know better than most of us do because you're watching some of those sectors very closely after that the last 10 years have been a pretty much a flat to marginally uh, uptick in in home values so you can say that you know this has not been a great investment for me but i wanted that i mean people i mean we knew that you know it is on a rampage so to speak the real estate prices but we got a place in in the same building where we were renting out and staying since we moved to bombay and uh, very familiar with the building with the neighbors and and lovely place with importantly the house has balconies all across the drawing room has two balconies the kitchen has a balcony the bedrooms have a balcony and well, where do you see that in in bombay right and they're not those window balconies they're proper get out into the balcony and see stuff outside yeah, kind yeah. of place affordability obviously by virtue of taking a housing loan there was down payment in the bank there was a beautiful house to buy so we just went ahead and bought the place yeah, so right. not an investment decision but emotion so that was the first part of your working life hmm. after that you began building an investment portfolio yeah after that uh, it has been touch wood uh, you know a, a phase of surplus right and and thanks to how one is brought up and one's own approach to life living luxury and discretionary spending etc there is surplus out of 
out of what I make. And therefore, uh, you know, I, I just got down to, to setting aside those surpluses for just investing, not to draw down, but just to invest. So that's how my longer tenure financial investment journey uh, began, you know, now maybe about 10, 12 plus odd years of investing for the long term. And it's kind of held me well so far, touch wood, I've never had to draw down yet. I do not foresee uh, an emergency, which is an uninsured emergency, which would make me draw down on that savings. So it's just continuing to stack up. And you always invest in mutual funds entirely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only mutual funds. I mean, uh, while, while it's very fashionable for us from the industry to say that regulations make it cumbersome for us to invest in direct equity, I do not think that I, I, I sincerely believed in the mutual fund way of working in my inability to be able to make prudent investment decisions for myself, you know, right from the start of, uh, you know, learning about financial investing. So all of my investments uh, in all of the asset classes that mutual funds offer is in mutual funds and we are the mutual fund route. I do not own direct stocks. Of course, there are ESOPs, etc. that come your way, but, uh, but you know, no direct stocks at all for me. So have you been diversifying away from ESOPs because that leads to a con concentration, right? Where you work in the same... I get your question, Neil, but frankly, I... I haven't applied too much of, uh, you know, time on it. Yeah, I do understand that. I mean, I do understand people saying that, listen, you know, you own so much of XYZ company because you're working for that company and, you know, do you want to diversify? Never really looked at it that way. It has worked well for me. You know, staying invested in ESOPs has worked well for me. I guess that's also a lot to do with, you know, the belief in the institution that you're associated with, right? And the optimism that uh, the institution will think it's worthwhile to keep investing into you. I've never really overthought, uh, you know, some of these things, Neil. I, I just thought that, you know, if, if we are touting simplification to the investor community, and really, again, to be honest with you, it's not coming from that higher pedestal of, listen, I am touting uh, simplicity, so I should live simplicity. No, it's not that kind of a compulsion, but that's how I've naturally been. I haven't really tried to make it complex or nuanced for myself. You may look back and say, you know, I may have lost out on, on some extra percentage of return for not uh, having been able to do that. But I think I've been fairly okay with how I've dealt with this. And then how many funds do you own and how do you pick your funds? The way I pick my funds is, you know, I have my back of the envelope understanding of my asset allocation. Uh, like I told you, a lot of my allocation today is for the longer term. And I do not have that term defined yet, right? At some point, I may have to draw down. Some of my investments have been like invested and untouched for, for more than 10 years maybe or close to 10 years, right? So uh, the I haven't really uh, gone about it in a, in a very scientific way, but I do know that my asset allocation calls for this much into equities and this much into fixed income. Within equity, you know, I would like this much of active management where I really want to dip into the fund manager's ability to draw alpha for me, right? And and for the rest, I want to just ride on, on what is available as listed corporate India. Now, if I want to participate in the prosperity of corporate India, I'm just happy looking at a large cap fund, at an index fund and, you know, pushing some money or the bulk of my money there. And then, you know, wanting some kind of a fund manager alpha via the mid cap, the, the multi cap kind of categories. So to answer your question on um, a number of uh, funds on the equity space, I wouldn't be owning more than three or four funds or three or four scheme categories, not fund house, but scheme categories mm -hmm. in um, likewise in fixed income. Again, not more than that. And how often do you rebalance? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, may not be very enlightening for your audience uh, because it's it's personal to me, right? And I really think that there is no, I mean, of course, there are mathematical formula, etc., age minus whatever to equity, to fixed income, etc. But the, the kind of uh, life stage that I'm in right now, um, uh, really investing for the long term with no visibility of wanting to draw down on money for in the near future. For the wants that I have envisaged already, I'm invested into fixed income. So incrementally, all my investment is getting into equities only, trying to increase, I'm, you can say this, I'm trying to catch up on the first 10 years of my productive work life 
which I missed investing in equity as an asset class. Uh, very strongly believe in uh, the ability of equity as an asset class to deliver returns over the long term. Do not think that uh, the, the rally of the past 10 years will continue. The volatility may only get starker. But okay, you know, with wanting to ride that wave, do envisage a productive um, work life for myself for at least maybe another decade. So just planning it in accordance with that. Maybe five years into the next decade, I may want to seriously start thinking about how I want to view some of uh, my investments and whether rebalancing away from equities, which is what I should be doing ideally, considering my current state of affairs, whether rebalancing from equity will be needed. So Vandana, currently you have a 70-20-10 split equity debt gold. Uh, gold uh, completely through the sovereign gold, uh, gold bond vehicle. Uh, no jewellery um, other than whatever one wears, uh, but otherwise no jewellery at all in relation to what you know of the Indian consumer, right? Or, or a typical Indian family. Because I do not think gold is just a woman's uh, decision in the country. It's a family decision. Mm -hmm. A man likes to get gold for for his women, uh, a father likes to get gold for his daughter and things like that. Uh, so from that construct, uh, you know, no jewelry at all other than what I wear. And what I'm wearing today is not real. It's a gift from my daughter. <laughs> so I'm wearing it for the first time. She insisted I wear this. Um, but uh, besides that, it's only sovereign gold bonds. So that would be about 10% uh, of my portfolio. Uh, I would probably add more to that because I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, because I do not have jewelry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe Maybe I should just have more of that. But yeah, the rest of the split is, uh, as you said, would like to uh, increase my equity exposure a little more. And you've roughly made a 10% return in the past 10 years. Yeah, you can say that because uh, a good part of my journey has been fixed in com meeting commitments, etc. So trying to catch up now uh, with respect to uh, return from financial investments. And what goals do you have? Uh, uh, financial goals mm -hmm. or life goals? Financial. Financial goals, I want to, uh, I want to be able to uh, set my kids up in their careers, really. I think I've provided for my retired life, say, 10 years down the line and assuming that I, I will live till 80, 85. Uh, if I outlive this, uh, you know, I hope I've provided for that as well, but really not then thought the kids about will it. Provide. Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I okay, let me put it this way. Uh, kids provide from their own volition to their parents, I guess, but really not at all in my radar to to encash them, <laughs> right? Not encashing my kids at all. Would be glad if uh, I'm able to leave behind stuff for them, really. I mean, that's really the mindset. Already have kind of allocated, designated whatever I have for them, will, etc. But uh, not really looking at them as my future cash flow stream. Huge believer in insurance. I'm a huge believer in insurance. So, you know, not for uh, for investment purposes to ensure a, a regular annuity or a cash flow. That I think my mutual fund investments will, will achieve that for me. But a huge believer in insurance because very early in life, I've been subject to mm -hmm. unexpected shock. Therefore, you know, I'm always looking out for more shocks, right, uh, which may just come unannounced. Therefore, adequately, you know, insured for health. Uh, and so I climb good. mountains, I, I take an insurance for death at 7,000 meters, okay, uh, so that my family is provided for. Um, so, yeah, adequately well insured. Um, so, my life goal is to set my kids up uh, well and to lead uh, a life uh, in retirement. Uh, which will let me travel uh, and uh, which will let me live peacefully in the city that I want to retire at. I mean, and, and buy books maybe. And you're well on track for it. If you wanted to, you could retire tomorrow and... I think so. Yes, I think so. I don't know if I'm well and on track, but yeah, broadly, yes, yes. Uh, so what kind of health cover do you have? So uh, one is what our work provides us, but really, you know, one changes jobs, etc. But I've been, a, you know, I've been sticking to my jobs. I mean, in the last whatever 20 odd years, this is my fourth uh, job now. And uh, so that's the plain vanilla cover that the workplace provides. Besides that, I have family floater policies. Uh, you know, I have a couple where in some my parents are also included. Um, some just for us as a nuclear family. So these are the health related covers I have. I have a cancer protect policy as well. So, so my mom is a survivor. My uh, 
grandpa, which is my dad's father, succumbed to cancer. So from both sides of the family, mom and dad, you know, we've had instances of cancer in the family. So I've kind of, you know, provided for that. So if you exclude the cancer cover, uh, what kind of health cover do you have? Uh, in terms of amount, mm -hmm. for a family of uh, four of us, including, uh, okay, let me exclude office. I have about uh, two crores of cover, health cover. And cancer would be another crore or? Yeah, cancer is actually not that much. It's about 50 odd lakhs of cancer. Plus, uh, I think my workplace provides, I'm not sure about my workplace because I just joined recently, I think about 25 to 30 lakhs, uh, including top up and all. And have you had to claim in the past and has it been a smooth experience? In terms of uh, health uh, yeah. cover? Yeah, I've had to claim and it's been, yes, it has been a smooth experience. I've, I mean, I, I have not had to claim for my own family, but for my parents, I, I've had to claim. Uh, in fact, during COVID, I took the Corona coverage uh, policy as well from, I think, United India, if I recall the insurer uh, well. Uh, and the, for me, uh, Tashwood, uh, every time my claim uh, process has been smooth. There mm. have been no, uh, there have been no unpleasant and surprises either in terms of um, the the elements that they decided not to cover or in terms of timelines uh, both uh, three times i think I've so my mom uh, has had episodes of being unwell hospital visits etc so i've extensively claimed on my cover so now let's talk about um, so you go running every single morning uh, most mornings yes <laughs> and a considerable amount as well right i think one hour yeah, because I'm a slow runner, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I do go out running. I also have begun to complement it uh, with time in the gym to aging body. So, you know, needs external uh, no, health to on Mumbai to roads, which is quite yeah. a feat. Yeah, it is quite a task actually, you know. I mean, if there is anything that builds resilience or, uh, you know, the, the bullheadedness about anything, it's about being able to get up in the morning and show up at wherever you want to show up in Bombay to start running because you have to do it before traffic uh, starts piling up. And in Bombay, traffic starts at 5.30 in the morning. So, uh, you know, if dogs are not chasing you, cars and bikers are. Uh, so, yes, I do try and take time out. For my answer. Do you think it's impacted you in how you view your personal finances? Yeah, so discipline if it's important in personal finance, which I think it is. Staying consistent at running has helped me uh, imbibe that well. I also run, you know, the longest distance I run is about 50. I haven't ever run more than that. Uh, so when you when you are uh, running the trail for a and you have to complete 50 kilometers within the whatever time frame has been set uh, then you know you really l want to last the course and lasting the course is a battle with your own self right so most of these trail runs are are structured in such a way that say in uh, 50 you may have about uh, 35 of trail and 15 of road so you hit the road and you start increasing your speed and you realize that these are tired legs already, which have already clocked 25 and increasing the speed there has actually rendered you completely immobile for the last 10. So you really plan with the goal in mind and therefore, you know, and try and stick to the plan irrespective of the temptations that may come along the trail for you to increase your pace because you want to just get done with it, right? You've been running all day. So you are like, Khatam karo isko. And sometimes, you know, you, you're, you're already finished. Khatam ho gaye ho aap, but abhi tak 50 khatam nahi hua hai. So you really have to keep at it, right? And therefore, you dip into whatever stores of mental motivation and physical energy you have. So all of that is, you know, really, uh, frankly, you know, in, in my investing journey, I haven't faced situations where I've had to get desperate, uh, you know, and view things with panic or, uh, or fear ever. Thanks to the fact that, you know, most of the commitments are taken care of or planned for and, you know, the investment is for the long term and we really believe that long term yields well. So if it reality it does or not, there is always that uh, sense of comfort that abhi to mera long term aya nahi hai. So never had the chance to get desperate about my investments. But uh, certainly, you know, I, I do think that resilience is and discipline is something that running has taught me not only for my investments, but for dealing with other aspects of life as well, work life, family life, for everything. Raising teens is not easy. <laughs> the harder marathon to run. Yeah, I mean, it's a never ending, unending marathon. In fact, you just reminded me. So, my uh, one of my first races in school 
I had no practice. But I thought if I run really fast as fast as I possibly can, I'll probably get it over with, right? And to my amazement, for the first maybe 30 meters, I was ahead of the pack. Oh, wow! But then I realized I'd done exactly what you said you shouldn't do, which is yeah. draw on my entire reserves yeah. of energy, and then I fell. Ah, uh, yeah. In fact. Uh, you know i was uh, recently looking at a clip of a full marathon where uh, a winner of an 800 meter race actually just could not continue the marathon and had to be helped etc so i think uh, planning ahead is something that marathons help you with and bear in mind that you know there are time constraints you really it is a high pressure day out there when you're running a race it may be a full marathon on the road which is uh, spoken about you know and there are uh, so many televised cameras and kids handing out glucon d and parle g to you like we have in mumbai marathons it can be a marathon in the forest like Uh, the other one that i run which is the malnad marathon which is a trail run where is no one around i mean you you are just lost right through there are just pink or red or whatever ribbons that they choose for the day to show that you are on the right path one in 10 kilometers they have a little cart where they have water for you to fill your uh, flasks etc and and some oranges and some refreshments bananas or something but otherwise there is no one for company right and and these are marathons where you sometimes feel very alone uh, and and then there is a pressure of time and and then you know that you're dipping in energy as well but you have to keep at it i guess so and that's what you end up doing i mean i've ended up doing that so far let's see how future marathons go yeah now you're also a farmer can you tell us about that okay i'm a fake farmer okay <laughs> let me please qualify that i'm not a farmer the way a farmer should be uh, i have been fortunate enough to uh, to have uh, you know family who are engaged in farming and i managed to get a piece of land uh, next door to their farm and uh, it was pandemic time and and the farm was a great place to to work out of and it it just felt uh, so good and i'm not trying to romanticize the farm it's far from it you know you get down to the farm you know that it's far from romanticizing the whole experience or the environment it is a lot of hard work i just figured that uh, it's something that i enjoy right and it's something that i enjoyed doing and this this piece of land came up for sale and um, you know i could pick that up and then you know when you pick up land thanks to the fact that again like i told you the family is a serious farming family it's an extended family so uh, you know along with theirs mine also gets farmed so uh, during the course of the pandemic i was engaging a lot more deeply with the entire exercise i i continue to do especially at uh, crucial points during the farming cycle which is you know the the sowing phase the, the harvesting phase and therefore i've been fortunate enough to experience kharif and rabi seasons now uh, for the last 3 years i've been uh, so tell us a typical annual cycle of a farm what yeah. crops do you plant when do you plant them right. when do you harvest them right so um, my farm is in the vidarbha region right which is a water shortage zone of the country uh, therefore the the crops that are uh, sown there are uh, uh, crops that can endure shorter of water So in the Kharif season, which is a summer sowing season, we uh, we typically uh, have uh, soya bean uh, and uh, tur dal, uh, pigeon pea. So this is July. Uh, this would be yeah. We sow some time in July, mm-hmm. and uh, we are ready to harvest uh, pre uh, winter on uh, just about uh, September October or um, yeah, just about October. or uh, a little into the winter in the case of tur dal right so you've uh, just finished your harvest i uh, just finished the soybean harvest uh, beginning to and the third crop that uh, that is an option for us is cotton mm-hmm. uh, so this year it's been cotton for the first year otherwise we've been uh, we've been sowing uh, soybean and tur dal all the uh, cotton is a crop where you have a uh, you have continuous cycles of harvesting so in soybean you harvest and that's it the farm is done you then prepare the farm for the rabi season whereas cotton has multiple cycles of harvesting from the same pot so mm. they keep uh, giving mm-hmm. so yeah this year we're doing uh, we're doing uh, cotton so you can do an swp from cotton you can do an swp from cotton brilliant yes you can do an swp from cotton and uh, we uh, we will uh, get done with the kharif season sometime uh, in november december and uh, immediately do the rabi sowing uh and uh, rabi season is basically wheat and brown chana kala chana which uh, in our uh, in our region these are the two crops uh and then summers are that we do nothing in summers because you know 50 degree more 
47 49 is what uh, with our region yeah so how does the economics of farming work how much do you have to put in what are the risks how much is it pay yeah. yeah so one thing i realized or learned is that you know never calculate roi uh, out of farming uh, because uh, you know it is and especially for us who are coming from a, you know who have exposure or who have earned our livelihood from a knowledge industry you will be shaken uh, you'll be in a state of shock when you sit down to do the math around uh, the economics uh, so in a good season the economics is as under you know especially for for the kind of crops that i spoke to you about you would have uh, so we could look at it as input costs and output costs so in input uh, like with any other business that uh, we are familiar with there is resource allocation right uh, resource allocation to to land labor and other inputs so our uh, input cost would work up to about 25 odd percent of uh, of the total cost right um, then you have uh, you have the soil prep cost or the land prep cost as they call it that comes expensive because it which involves is plowing. which is plowing and it's not just plowing uh, it's also you know doing a couple of rounds if you like because that that helps aerate the soil so we use what is called as a rotavator to do that uh, and then you know you use uh, at the time of sowing you use again what is called as a seed drilling uh, equipment uh, all of them are mounted on tractors typically tractor drinks diesel and therefore that cost Uh, so all of this equipment costs works up to about 30 odd percent of the overall cost besides that there is labor because uh, despite using equipments you still need labor for various activities so mostly during harvesting activity but in the case of uh, cotton even during sowing right because cotton seeds are very expensive and you know they need to be sown in the right uh, proportion which a seed drill may not be able to uh, achieve uh, so you know labor cost is another say 30 odd percent and then you have other incidental costs like for instance say Uh, your crop is affected by pests your crop is affected by some diseases some of these diseases are uh, you know uh, fungus led some of these diseases are virus led then you have to treat It's them incredible right? even plants get viruses yes <laughs> yeah correct and and they spread fast just like we have seen sometimes in our farm where the disease start uh, uh, with a small patch and you come back 3 days later and that patch that yellow patch is just increased in size right it's like uh, watching in inside your body uh, is what gets unfolded on the farm uh, so you know when when the harvest uh, is done then there is threshing to remove the grains from the pods or the husks whichever way the the whatever the crop is and then you haul them to the mandis to sell so there is some cost associated with that uh, so so yeah for uh, for our region for soybean uh you know one acre would cost about say 15000 to 20000 of investment mm -hmm. there is no visibility on the price that you would get at the end of the tenure uh, they fluctuate that much so they fluctuate that so there are the pro the the okay i don't want to make it sound like a you know a, a problem course but then you know you first i think the at the heart of the problems is that you do not know the yield from your acre that you will end up having so uh, what is typically an average of about 8 to 9 quintals per acre from our uh, for for our region this season we ended up uh, making about 4 quintals only because the plants got diseased right during the course the year prior to that it was a complete washout because we had sown and there were huge rains heavy rains which just completely washed away to the extent that uh, a, a good part of our soil was washed away so we had bigger problems about uh, the soil getting washed away and again very we, counter to that too much rain in place like vidarbha resulted in yeah resulted in this problem right it was a water shock that the crop went through and we completely lost i mean we we yielded nothing the last time you had an npa we had an npa yeah totally i mean we were bankrupt Uh, so uh, you know while while it is in humor because my my investment every season is not much and i can afford to lose that money uh, this is not the life story of the real farmer right that's why i call myself a fake farmer we do everything that any other farmer does on the field when when we go uh, we are spending the whole day at the farm we are we are doing what our laborers would be doing to the extent that we can so that way we are very uh, deeply and actively engaged in the activity of farming but just that 
the sheer ability for me to stomach my losses versus what it is for the real farmer, which is that the money that he makes is going to determine how he lives for the next three, four months. And when I say how he lives, it's about meeting his food needs. It's about meeting his kids' school fees needs, things like those. Uh, I think the farmer today is uh, has a lot stacked against him. A lot of, uh, you know, imponderable as far as he is concerned. I mean, we talk so much about planning, uh, right, Neil, about uh, how do you plan your life and how how are your financial investments speaking uh, to that plan, uh, you know, uh, and, and you look at uh, the other side of, uh, you know, of, of the community in India itself, right? And here, uh, I rub shoulders with them when I'm on the farm because... I'm as much a farmer there as my next door farmer. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, the difference is stark. The difference is really stark. And their resilience to actually come back the next season, despite having seen a washout the previous season. You can say there is no other option. Yes, but, you know, the ability to come back, I think it's brilliant. So this year, you had half your crop destroyed by the... Uh, uh, by the, yeah, virus attack yeah. this year. So were you able to make a profit or not? No, we ended up making a profit. So uh, if I were to give you in, in terms that we understand, we made a profit on, a, say, a four acre land worth about 4,000 rupees a month. Hmm. We made about 17,000. It was a it was a four month crop for us soybean that uh, yields about four thousand a month on a four acre plot of land. That is and and bear in mind that in India the average uh, land holding is about two and a half acres for the farmer. Matlab uh, if he is uh, he is surviving only on this income, usne mahine ka do hazar banaya at the end of one uh, cropping season, which is half his year, right? Uh, how far does 2000 bucks go for a family of assume four, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's the state of uh, economic affairs <laughs> of agri. Yeah. But of course, you can turn back and say, listen, there are other states which are doing exceedingly well. Maybe this is this is my experience from uh, from my little space where I'm associated with. How do you envision your retirement? Would you move to the farm? Would you what would you do? Yeah, I want to uh, spend time. Um, at the farm in good season because summers are really yeah hard there certainly i want to i mean if uh, you know if time and um, inclination permitted i'd like to have a home also built uh, on the farm but um, you know i would like to spend my time uh, in a city which has a big big park and uh, <laughs> at the same time is growing at a nice pace which is a good balance between modernity and some element of uh, traditionalism a city which serves uh, 12 rupees filter coffee <laughs> double strong sounds like bangalore <laughs> yeah yeah some city like that that's my plan and um, in terms of getting there so you have your mutual fund portfolio yeah. intact are you also relying on a uh, provident fund or nps any of that yeah so my uh, provident fund is there at the back of my mind as a kitty that i have and that's continuing to grow and i recognize that some part of it and an increasing part of it is going into equity. So it's only off late that I've started thinking about that also as an equity exposure to the extent that it is exposed to equity because I've been otherwise uh, increasing my equity exposure via my mutual fund uh, portfolio. So yeah, I'm looking at it, uh, but I'm hoping that, you know, that that is a fallback option and, and most of my mutual fund investments and maybe some rental income from some, uh, you know, some place should uh, should help me uh, tide over uh, my everyday living expenses. And um, yeah, I also kind of uh, nurse uh, an, an inclination to take up uh, some teaching assignments, etc. And uh, that again, there should be some source of income for as long as your mind is uh, is agile do not know about the body but at least as long as the mind is agile and i think i'll kind of be engaged in that i'm working towards building that alternate uh, not a career but an alternate option uh, you know trying to skill myself academically to speak to those requirements let's see how that goes i mean that work in progress and how about nps and public provident fund? i haven't uh, used them at okay. all uh, I haven't used them at all. Thanks for reminding me. I do have some uh, post office accounts uh, in my 
daughter's name. Sukanya Samradhi mm. was a big hit at home. Uh, so my my dad actually hit me into it. So I keep paying up uh, that. I, I really have to look into see. Uh, my dad manages that part of my book. But I think great investment. Uh, really great investment. I do not know sustainable, not sustainable. I mean, those are macro discussions that we can have about government finances. But it does add to our finances for sure. One final thing. So... In your job, you interact with a lot of institutions, a lot of companies on how they should invest their money. Is there a difference between how they think and how individuals think? Is it more they have to deal with pressures of quarterly results and boards? Any insights from there? Yeah, so I think the biggest undoing for corporate treasuries, uh, you know, in terms of the compulsions that they go through, is that they are uh, answerable to to on a quarterly basis to whoever. I mean predominantly to shareholders, to their boards, obviously, to their investment committees or ICs as they call them. So, you know, uh, they have they are answerable to sh uh, stakeholders and that makes them think only quarter to quarter. And, uh, all, uh, you know, in my experience of having dealt with pretty much the same corporates over the last 20 years and therefore having seen uh, the life cycle or the cash life cycle of these corporates, uh, at least clearly the large, uh, the, the nifty 50 companies, right? Almost all of them are mutual fund investors. Almost all of them are relationships that have been carrying over the last so many years. I have not seen a year, Neil, where the AUMs would have dropped. Uh, from from this segment right mm -hmm. we have done a lot of you know when when we sit down to do our um, our budgets for the year etc you're trying to map uh, map the economic cycle uh, the the interest rate environment um, the capacity utilization cycle to see what in your opinion corporate india will do this year will they invest will they draw down on, on their investments so what i've noticed is that the aums move from very near end products to say slightly longer tenure products uh, on the fixed income curve so they're always on the yield curve only as they get more comfortable with yeah as they get more comfortable with their interest rate views as they get more comfortable with their uh, uh, capex plans uh, or they have more visibility on their capex plans uh, they would move from say uh, a one month maturity product aka a liquid fund to say at best a three year maturity product aka a short term bond fund a corporate bond fund uh, they do not compromise on credit quality at all as they shouldn't because if they do then they should look at equity because at least in equity you there is no limit on the upside whereas in a credit fund i am uh, putting a limit on your upside by giving you a coupon mm. and not really letting you participate in that big journey which an equity allows you to so you want to take a call on a company or a sector which you think is on a on a j curve or an, on an upswing do that via the equity route and not really the credit fund route so which is my very strong belief conviction which i communicate to my customers as well so what we have seen is that they're moving uh, they're using term spreads so either from one year to one month to three years uh, in terms of product maturity and that's all that they keep doing the so AUMs have not our, shrunk uh, viewers what a term spread is yeah uh, a term spread is the difference um, uh, in in yield that you get for every incremental maturity that you have so for example to put it more simply say you have a one month fd uh, or you don't have those fds you have a say a six month fd versus a three year fd you ideally expect more uh, uh, interest from a three year fd and lesser from a one month so that's the term spread term year meaning term to maturity of your product spread meaning the uh, the difference between a longer tenure uh, proposition and a shorter tenure proposition so we have seen corporate india do only that which means that their investable surplus has only been as steady and it's been showing a growth in line with how you know earnings growth have been getting reflected etc but they really do not or have not done justice to their uh, you know available corpus over the past so many years as i have witnessed it right because they are uh, they are burdened by the compulsions of quarterly uh, report cards uh, and and compare that to us as individuals you are a, you decide where you want to invest for how long and you're answerable to yourself only so that flexibility helps i think in optimizing returns so they tend to be scared and risk averse as opposed to individuals uh, i'm not sure if i want to call it scared i i just think that uh, you know a they are in 
some other business, right? Uh, and obviously, I'm not taking names here, but say it's a car manufacturing company or a scooter manufacturing company or a bike manufacturing company. Their business is car or bike manufacturing. Uh, the questions that are raised uh, to them or on monthly sales numbers and, you know, everything else is just a, you know, a side item, a, a, a line item which appears at the very uh, fag end of their disclosures. Now, if one of those line items is treasury, losses mm. in a quarter right so there are there are i mean you would be aware there are numerous instances where say the rbi in the in the past policy brought about a liquidity draining out measure which meant that suddenly you know bond deals went up and there is as we speak kind of a underperformance in fixed income portfolios now if i'm a corporate investor who's a scooter manufacturer mm -hmm. and you know i have a treasury income which last quarter i showed this this is this is notional income this is not mm -hmm. booked income right this is nav to nav not notional income but okay. you know book income right not booked income now suddenly this month uh, this quarter end i am showing an nav or a rate of return which is lesser than the previous quarter end i immediately get asked that uh, kya kya treasury mein you know loss kyu kar diya right and uh, none of the cfos are see i think incentivization is also the other metric here which is at play because none of the cf cfos are incentivized to make money on treasury books right they are only incentivized to protect their treasury mm -hmm. surpluses and meet the company's needs as and when it is needed either for daily working capital or for uh, you know to meet the capex mm -hmm. needs so there's no incentive also for them to really say that, listen, you know, uh, to educate the stakeholders that do not question me quarter to quarter times. Plus accounting principles also, you know, render it a little difficult because they have to, they cannot account, even if I have a three year investment horizon as a treasurer, I have to keep accounting for my current market prices at every quarter. Mark to market. Yeah, it's basically mark to market. You're absolutely right. So I have to keep valuing my assets at mark to market price. Prices. Now, therefore, any intermittent volatility, which we keep telling customers to ignore, is something that the CFOs are always answerable to, right? So, that's a, that's a huge dissonance in how publicly held companies are looked at. Not their fault, it's how they are looked at, how they are questioned by stakeholders, uh, which makes them, you know, look at this with a very, very short tenure lens. And I guess that's the that's in effect an undoing, you know, an inability to earn the optimal return, considering that they're anyway holding that surplus for three years, five years, seven years. So they're unable to plan it for that tenure. Vandana, thank you so much. It was lovely yeah. speaking to you. Pleasure. I spoke a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. It's you. enjoyable always catching up with you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing.